There we go. Hey. Hey, how, how are, are you? you? Good. Um, thanks for joining this live interview. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing an Instagram live, so um, as okay. many are probably at this time. <laughs> Great. Um, so let me just quickly introduce what we're doing, and then we'll get into it. Okay. Um, so this is a part of um, so this is the first in Instagram live interview that we're doing at Special Special for the Artist Tools exhibition. And since we're all in quarantine now, we have decided to bring our exhibition, Artist Tools, onto a digital experience so more people can enjoy it. Uh, our, the Artist Tools exhibition opened on March 12th, uh, like you were there at the opening, and then the very next day. You had to close the next day, right? <laughs> so we were only there for one day, um, one evening. We only opened the show for one evening. And there's 32 artists in the group show and um, 49 tools that were made. And so now we have to come up with ways, creative ways to present it online. And it's part of um, this digital programming that we started is called Together Alone. And so far it has included uh, Insta Instagram takeovers by some artists in the exhibition, uh, Show and Tell, which is our digital online um, exhibition series that we send digital artworks direct to people in the email, in the email who are mm -hmm. subscribed to the newsletter. Uh, we did a remote jam session last Friday, which was really fun with three of the artists that are in the show with their artist tools uh, synthesizers. That they have. Oh, those were cool. I was playing with those at the at the opening. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you, and uh, and then we also share a bedtime story every Saturday. So, I caught half. I caught half of one of those. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you like it? I like. I liked it. <laughs> well, there's more to come. Oh, yeah, also, you bought the deck. The exactly. Episode. Exactly. We've put it to great use. We can talk about that if you want. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of really fun stuff that like we're kind of exploring now. And this is our first Instagram interview with the artist. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Um, let me just introduce you okay. or yourself. No, you, why don't you try? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I mean, it's very brief, but anyway, so you're, so Kevin Abash, who we have here is a conceptual artist based in New York. And you, uh, you one of your artist tools is included in our art tools exhibit. Um, and so I'm sure. So let's uh, begin with that. Uh, okay. Well, first off, I thought it was a very cool idea for a show. Um, uh, as, as soon as I saw that you were you were put, you were curating a show around, uh, it was it was what it was art tools that we use as practical tools of the trade and also sort of artist uh, interp uh, visions of tools of the future, or <laughs> I don't know. There, there, were, there were also, what was the second part of it? The, sorry? There were, there were, there were, two, there, there were two qualifications. One was tools that artists actually use, and the other one were, were just art, artists. Uh, or like tools that, that like kind of take, it, take the place of something that you wouldn't have usually um, that kind of helps in artist practice. Right, right, right. What that may be. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I contributed a, uh, a clip that I use uh, usually when I'm working with photography and I need to in some way manage the light, usually on, on a small light, I'm like a macro photograph, if I'm getting, um, or if I want to kick a little bit of light into the, into the uh, into one corner, it's essentially, it's a, it's a, it's a chopstick that has been, epoxied to a, a little metal alligator clip. But because the alligator clip, which is chrome, could throw a little light, I spray painted with a matte black. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, but it, but it, I, it got me thinking. Like, I, there are a lot of tools. I think most artists have these little improvised things they do, but that's one that I use quite a lot. Do you have one lying around by any chance? I don't. I think you have. <laughs> I think actually, it's funny, because I, I was, wait, do I? No, I don't. I don't. I to ask you about it earlier and then I forgot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, like what, so what made you, like, what do you hold up? And, like, what made you make it in the first place? 
So, um, well, you only have so many hands. Um, and I don't, I don't usually work with a tripod. That's interesting. Yeah, it's probably because I don't usually work with a, a tripod, even though I see in the back there, I have a camera. That's not, that's, I don't, that's not for my photography. That's actually a, 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 a little robotic uh, kind of panning, you know, tool that, that I have in the back. My camera's on, a, on, on something. But I don't use that really for photography. But um, so usually I'm, I'm holding the camera and with one hand. And so then I have one other hand to do something. And then, um, so I'll actually, sometimes I'll hold the, the tool with the, with, the, with the stick and the clip. Um, sometimes it's to block light. Sometimes mm -hmm. I use it to actually hold an item. Um, and again, like I, I, I once, uh, a little sapling, I took a picture of a sapling once and, and that I, ha I had that held in just, and then I kind of Photoshopped a little bit of, I mean, you could see the little bit of uh, matte black uh, clip and I just get rid of that digitally, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's just one of those things that, uh, yeah. I mean, I thought it looks, I thought it, it, I put a little more work into that than some of the other tools. Mo usually my tools are like, I take a piece of cardboard, fold it up and it's used for something. <laughs> <laughs> different color. Say that again. Do you ever paint it a different color for like different? Um... White. Yeah, white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because I was shooting against white and I just wanted it to disappear. It reminds me of when I met you, you had that big, um, huge, large format camera. Oh, you saw, oh, I brought that to your place. Yeah. That is, that doesn't get out on the road very often because you saw how huge it is. I actually have it here. And Hold on a second. Did. Yeah, go on. Oh. Go on, conti continue. I can hear you. I was just thinking about that today. Oh my God. Okay, hold on. Um, what if I drop this? What if I drop this on, on our live stream? Okay, no, I won't. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and look at that. Whoa. I mean, that's a serious camera, right? Yeah. It's, I, I, I've been saying it's 133 years old, but I've been saying that for about 10 years. So like, it's probably like pushing 140. <laughs> I mean, look at that lens on there, right? And there's, no, and there's no aperture and there's no shutter. When you want to take a picture, you essentially cover it and you say, okay, you ready? And one, two, three, and then you cover it, you know, like that. <laughs> and you and I rigged it to uh, digital. Uh, right, right. So what, what I did is the, the, the ground glass on the back, it's 11 by 14 inches, which is, you know, pretty large ground glass compared to say on like a little twin lens camera or a Hasselblad or something. So if you photograph it digitally, the back of it, it actually resolves quite well. Um, and so, yeah, I, I put a big black, a big black hood over. Um, and then sometimes I shoot with my, with my uh, DSLR or even with just an iPhone right off the back of the ground glass. Um, and that lens just adds a type of distortion that is magical. And then, and then the, the ground glass, because it's like 140 years old, it's all scratched up and has like little weird, like acid pitting and stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of the ultimate Instagram filter, you know, uh, <laughs> except much cooler. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, so do you, like, I would, I was thinking that that's kind of like a tool that, that's also a tool that you convert it from like analog all. Do you have like, do you, how has like, that kind of form, sort of informed your practice. Right, so just to let you know, you're breaking up a bit, um, and in fact, your video is frozen. Yeah, uh, you're, you're frozen. Oh, I'm frozen too, let me, I can go quickly just to see. Uh, you're still free. There we go. Okay. okay. Now do you see me? I see you. Yeah. Uh, I don't see you. You're like still the way you were. Oh. Yeah. I'm on my fast connection. Mm. Oh, okay. You're back. Okay, good. So I think you asked about how does uh, something inform something. Um, uh, you have like a lot of things that are like kind of very lo-fi, like the right. clip that's a chopstick and a clip and like. A totally. Old so camera, yeah. I love that. I love I love using um, I love using sophisticated technology in low fidelity ways, mm -hmm. and I and I think I like using kind of low fidelity technology in 
sophisticated ways, <laughs> you know, you know, and, and so, right. It's, uh, you know, it, and I love that it took, you know, 130 some years for me to be able to use this thing in the way that I do. I mean, I had no choice, but, but I, I like that. That's just the way things worked out. Um, because, and, and it's, you know, it's just kind of repurposing. It's, uh, what, what's the term? What is it? We're up, uh, up, uh, upselling, upscaling. What do they call that? Up, you know, when you repurpose something in the, in the spirit of like not throwing it out. Huh. What's that word called? Our audience can tell us. I'm sure somebody knows. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, you're right. I do, I do, I do that a lot. Uh, I mean, I, I think, I think even in the work where, in which I'm using, um, uh, hmm? is it upcycle? Upcycle. That's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think even in the, uh, in the, uh, when I, when I, when I employ, uh, you know, AI algorithms and stuff, um, or other sort of generative techniques, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I suppose, not skill. Um, there are kind of like decades of, of knowledge and awareness of the technology uh, on, on my part that have gone into it. And yet when it's time to execute, sometimes um, I go very lo-fi. Uh, oh, well, usually because it suits what I'm going for. Usually it's, it's um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm usually not using technology to show off, but to kind of just augment what I'm already doing. I mean, technology is photography. I mean, photography is technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, it's uh, uh, whether it's a it's a camera or it's a, or it's a, a, a snippet of code uh, or it's uh, you know a series of lasers. Um, I uh, I think you know it, it it sort of all blends all blends together. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it's what? have available to you that kind of informs what you're you want to do i think very much so i think i think i think most artists think like that too you you know new tools present themselves new mediums present themselves um i mean sure uh that's yeah when, whenever i am introduced to something that maybe i didn't know my first thought is like hmm what could i use that for you know somebody the other day had had a well, now they have much more sophisticated machines, but it was one of these kind of uh, like 1970s kind of programmatic embroidery machines um, that you could make, you know, huge uh, textiles with, or you'd, you'd put like a large bolt of fabric in and this thing, would, and, and actually the same person had a, like a, like a 19, maybe early 80s um, mechanical, very crude, but embroidery, like, no, like crocheted, it was a cro crocheting machine. I mean, and, you know, I think with a, with a few, not even a few weeks, I think a couple of weeks of tweaking around and, you know, I think I could, <laughs> I could, uh, I could put something like that to use. That was someone that you, that's not your tool, it's someone else's? No, 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 no. Yeah, exactly. No, people, you know, people, things, I'm trying to think of things that have been thrown away. Oh, yeah, actually, like, it just happens to be there. So you see that, that bluish thing on the wall? So that is a that is one of about forty um, color samples, glass color samples that I found. I was walking in Minnesota. I was in St. Paul, Minnesota, walking down the road, and there was an old, like, businessman's not like a salesperson's, uh, like a like a like a, what a traveling salesperson's case, and it was you know with the with the rubbish, and and the, 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 they were about to collect it, and I saw it, and I'm like. I don't know what that is, but I've, I've got to check it out. So I run over, I pick it up and it's really heavy. Now it could have been anything. It could have been lead. It could have been a body part. I didn't, you know, I had no idea what was in there, but I brought it back and I opened it up and there, there was a denim, uh, uh, there was this folded like 10 times over set of sl denim sleeves. And in each sleeve was like this eight inch tall, maybe like yeah, four by eight inch um, sample. And what it was, it was a company that did uh, uh, coatings for windows. So, you know, UV coatings, colorful coatings. Um, and they're all, you know, coated with, you know, that's like blue frost, I think it's called, or it's called something like that. And, um, and, so, and so I use these things though. So, and, and that's why I kind of, um, that one I sort of immortalized that they, they became tools I used quite regularly. Um, 
I would I would view things through these. I'd photograph things through them. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, who knew that like this little case I'd find on the road would sort of factor into my work. Wow. You know, for, yeah. It's like fate. But it is like fate. <laughs> that somebody would just leave that. It's like probably some oh. company that. It, it was no, but the thing you could look at so all the brochures and and pricing and this, you know all that all that you know collateral that was in there was from the 50s. So, you. Yeah, I mean, the case, I still have the case. It's an ugly little case, right? It's like <laughs> an ugly little case. Um, but when I opened it, and, and then there was even a, like a light meter in there too, like a really, like an old fashioned kind of just, you know, analog light meter. So that I guess you could, you know, as you're selling your thing, it's like, look, and, uh, you know, we still get so many lumens, even though we have this coating on. <laughs> <laughs> What a heavy weight for that traveling salesman. In a That's business. what I was thinking. It was. It was. Maybe, he had, maybe he had one of those little push carts, uh, you know, pull carts. Yeah, exactly. But now you have it framed in the back? Well, that's a photograph of it. Oh, okay. You know, right. So, uh, so most, as you, I think you know, most of my work deals with matters of identity and, and value and um, uh, the usually things stand in as proxies for other things. Um, and then sometimes there are objects that have, uh, they have meaning to me because um, I've, I've spent time with them. In some way, they become part of me. Uh, and uh, there are times where I, I find it, it's not like a problem, but I find it difficult to, to discern where I end and that either my subject or even the tool I'm working with end and vice versa. I don't know where that line is sometimes. Um, and then that piece of glass became one of those. Um, it was sort of omnipresent. Um, I even stacked them up when there was an eclipse. I'd, I'd, I'd stack them up and that's how I'd view the eclipse. And they just be, I used them for everything. I would use them to change my mood. I would, uh, I would, I would, I would, I'd see a scene and I'd be like, hmm. And then I'd take maybe not that one, but another one and just put it over and I'd stare out at the trees and everything. And I'd be like, oh, it's like a whole other universe. <laughs> that's great. Giving life, giving life to something that was going to end up in the, in the, in the, in the, in the trash dump. Wow. That's amazing. It's, it also found the perfect person because anyone else who had picked it up wouldn't have known with that. It found me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, so where are you currently? Currently I'm uh, Upper East Side. In your, in your studio? Yeah. At home studio. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, this is my, my multi-purpose kind of room. You can see behind me. There's some windows, table. Nice. Yeah. Um, the and then I, I don't know if you know, but Julia, uh, my wife, she is currently on the front lines. Uh, you know, at the hospital at Mount Sinai, doing her uh, doctor thing. How's she doing? Well, yesterday was a hellish day. Apparently, she was working in the emergency room emergency department um, and you know you can imagine how grim it is um, and obviously more exposure more potential exposure to the virus you know so so it's it's uh, and 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 she had been she'd been she's been around it now for the whole you know the better part of the month but emergency room and ICU are two different things mm -hmm. um, so it's hard not to but uh, yeah I mean, just like little things, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people have, you know, healthcare uh, people in their family, but like one of the things, like the thing that disturbs her, well, I can't say it disturbs the most, obviously the death disturbs her the most, but, but it's, it's, it really is hard work. They wear those N95 masks and, and the shields and, you, you know, they keep the rooms very warm for the patients and you're breathing into this thing, you're breathing your own kind of recirculated air, you know, the oxygen isn't, you're, you're basically breathing in your own CO2, carbon dioxide and you become kind of faint and you can't just quickly take it off and have some water without potential risk of exposure. And so it's, and, 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 and for hours, sometimes, you know, we put on masks, we go out just for like a little bit, but for hours. And, it, and then they, and then it's really noisy in there with alarms buzzing. I've, I've, I've heard the sound, you know, uh, and, and they can't hear each other because they're all wearing these masks. So it's just like not an ideal work environment. I mean, it's pretty stressful. How many hours a day is she at the hospital? She did seven hours yesterday. Mm -hmm. So she went in at three and came back at, actually it was a little longer, like like 10.30. Is 
Is there anything um, that we might not know about what's going on that she's like seeing in the hospital that doesn't get enough coverage? I mean, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty chaotic. Uh, no, I mean, I think, I don't think so. I don't, I mean, unless, you know, unless you choose to uh, listen to Trump, uh, no, it's pretty much the way the normal media sort of presents it. Yeah. How has it affected your family? I know you have two kids. Yeah. So, yeah, I have two sons, uh, 10 and seven. Um, those are their ages, not their names. <laughs> uh, they, they're taking it in stride. Like, I think they, with the homeschooling, which is something we wanted to do anyway, uh, this is just made that. Older. No, we, so we had been fantasizing about it for years. Um, and I mean, like really looking into it uh, because, you know, we travel a lot. And um, I took Nathan on a trip to Japan for two weeks. And uh, I mean, he learned more in two weeks than he, than he did in the whole school year. Um, so I, as soon as, when I realized that, and I think about my own, you know, uh, fortunate uh, circumstance in which I traveled a lot as a kid, I realized like where, you know, where, where real knowledge, sophisticated knowledge comes from. And I don't think it's from sitting in, in a class, you know, competing with a few other people for scraps. And, and so I, I just, just gave, I think we were early. We pulled the kids out quite early. Um, and it's been great ever since. And yeah, I mean, it was funny. I, we, we take them out. They, you go to the park, keep distance and everything. And, um, but no, I mean, now with, now with, uh, with Julia being in the hospital in such close proximity to all the, you know, all the, all the virus and stuff, um, there's this issue about, you know, should she be quarantined? Um, and yeah, my, my, my background is microbiology. So I have very, I have very strong feelings about all of this stuff. So what, what's, uh, how, like, what well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, okay, so I mean, it's a little more complicated of a story. And I'm sure lot, I'm sure lots of people who will see this will, will, will have a similar thing. Like, I, I, I'm wondering if I didn't already have it. Mm -hmm. I came back, I think I, when I saw you, I don't know, I, saw, I don't know how many weeks ago I saw you, but I came back from Russia about seven weeks ago. I had been to Paris, then Russia, and then came back. And I was in bed for three days, like wiped out, you know, like, you know, I, and it's so strange because before I went to Russia, I was concerned that I might contract it over there. And then when I came home in bed from morning till night, one night, bad fever, you know, chest stuff, dry cough, the whole thing. It didn't occur to me that it could be COVID. Like that's the, that, that's the part I don't understand. Like, why is that not the first thing I thought it was? Huh. But, 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 and then, and then the symptom. Hmm? This is January? You no, know, not January. It was like last six, six, seven weeks ago. Oh, oh, wow. Right. Yeah, and so, and then I and and and, and then I do, and I'm perfectly willing to think it's all psychosomatic. <laughs> well, that was not that 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 was definitely not psychosomatic. But but subsequently, for weeks, I've sort of felt a little off, you know, a little GI issue, a little like you know, in the middle of the day, I just have to take a nap, um, and I just put that off to sort of free floating anxiety, or I don't know, I don't know what, but but. Um, I mean, I would love, I think everybody, I, I don't know, how have you been? Have you felt fine the whole time? Yeah, uh, I, I haven't been sick like that um, this whole time. Good, good. Yeah. Um, and I'm also uh, in New Jersey right now. Um, oh, okay, okay. So we're, we've been isolated in um, yeah. our, home, our family home. Good, good, good. Um, so trying to stay away. And, and so, yeah, like we... We know it's really, really bad. So like we also experienced, we also heard all about what was going on in China. So we've been aware of it for, since early January. And when did you get back? When did you get back from over there? Uh, so my family was in, so we were in China in, for New Year. Right. So January, so then we came back around January 7th, 6th or 7th. You weren't in Macau after that? Uh, we were in Macau, and then we went into uh, mainland China to my okay. hometown. Um, yeah. for days. And so this was like right before, like we were just kind of heard small, like small news stories in China about, sure. but we didn't really like, it wasn't an international thing. No. And then I, 
right before Chinese New Year, I have one really close friend who um, lives in Beijing, and then she was going to her roommate's, she was going to spend Chinese New Year with her roommate's family who live in Hubei. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Robin says Wuhan, and like there wasn't any like <laughs> any quarantine or anything at the time, and so she she just heard like some friends telling her, oh don't don't go, it sounds really bad, and then but she was like I already booked tickets, and there was like nothing in the media saying don't go yet, and then she went with her roommate. As soon as she arrived the next day, they shut it down. They shut the whole province down. And she ended up being in quarantine there for two weeks. And then she also later ended up going, um, she's a British national. Mm. She was stuck there. And then British, like people, countries all around the world were taking their citizens out of, uh, yeah. out of Hubei province. So she uh, ended up evac safely evacuating from there uh, to England and then London. So what was meant to be a five day trip for her ended up now being three plus months on. Um, but what's really great about it is that she's a journalist, so she's mm. been about it, and it's actually afforded her, it's actually provided her with a great opportunity to cover her experience, and she's been, sure. um, her stories have been all over now. Mm. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, so I've been like, so this has been really, um, like, kind of exciting in a weird way for her. Yeah. Because it's like kind of like war journalist. No, but this word you're using, exciting. So I feel, I mean, at times I feel kind of awful. People, people say like, how are you? How are you getting on? How are you feeling? And it is exciting. I mean, by the, def by the actual definition of the word, you know, that's, whether it's sad or uh, tragic, it's one thing. But it, it is exciting what's going on. Um, and I mean, and also I think it's fascinating to see how it's going to play out. I mean, mm. if, if you're able to sort of remove yourself from it for a moment, you know, how, what does this look like in a month from now, in a year from now? And it's you kind know. of interesting to see the wave of people's, of the global reaction as like things were really bad in China and then it escalated in Europe and then now it's come to Europe. But that's the thing. So I, I, I you know, I work a lot with, in China and so I'm speaking to them there and they're like, hey, it's all good now. And they're asked, they're talking to me like business as usual. I'm like, hey, take it easy. Like we're on shutdown. <laughs> You know, they, they, like, you remember when you were, you were in the same situation like a, like a month ago? Yeah, they, it, it, we, that kind of freaked me out that they were sort of like back to business. Mm. Um, I worked with somebody, I was working with an actor on a project uh, and it turned out he was from Hubei. And, uh, and I was like, really? And, and uh, well, anyway, yeah. So um, he, he wasn't an actor. He was actually somebody in, uh, in the uh, medical science uh, space. And he told me that he was... Uh, in three weeks, I was wondering, can I get you back if I need you to shoot something? And he said, actually, in three weeks, I'm going to Japan to do uh, some contract work for a company. And I'm like, you are? I was like, are you sure you are? Are you sure you, sure? you think you're going to get on a plane to Tokyo, be in from Hubei in the middle of all this? Like, I'm not so sure about that. He and hmm? He lives there? He had a contract to work. He had been working there. He moves around a lot. You know, kind of esteemed uh, scientist. And he... Um, and then in uh, like three, I guess three weeks later, I got a text from him. He goes, uh, well, you, I, I don't think he called me a prophet. I said, I don't think you need to be a prophet. I, I was pretty sure they're not going to let you in. Apparently they took him off the plane. He was already seated on the plane. And then I don't know what happened. Something Hubei, bump, they got him off. But it was that. <laughs> it was the fact that it said that in his passport he was from Hubei. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so I know that you're working on it right now. How's that been going? On the, on the film? Yeah. It's going well. I mean, so I had been working on this project going back uh, in, last year where I, was sh I shot in India, I shot in China, I shot in Russia. Um, I was doing a film about sort of how information gets weaponized and, um, and uh, disinformation and post-truth society. And, uh, and then this thing emerged and again, sort of with my background and my interest actually in pandemics, I started watching this. I'm like, if this thing really kind of expands, you know, this could be the perfect uh, vehicle to communicate so much of what, what I want to communicate is how people capitalize on something like this. And suddenly all these different factions, all these different groups are trying to use coronavirus, you know, uh, for their for their 
their bizarre, uh, you know, uh, agendas. Uh, you know, it's, 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 whether it's anti-Chinese or anti-Jewish or anti-this or anti-that, but it's usually anti-something. It's never positive. Um, and, uh, and then the different ways that people exploit it and the ways that people who have uh, perhaps access to information even half a day before other people do, how they can turn that into billions of dollars uh, by placing the right bet on the stock market, knowing that, for instance, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Italy is going to announce that uh, suddenly their uh, inf you know, uh, infection rate has gone up you know, tenfold. Um, and so I looked at everything I had shot, and I'm like, well, hold on a second. Like, can I actually just bolt this thing on? Like, how do I, you know, and, I, and, I, and strangely enough, I could. Um, I, I won't get into it, but like even all the stuff I shot in China, I really actually had to just tweak like one thing. Uh, and suddenly it was, uh, suddenly it was, <laughs> it just, it just worked. It just worked. Um, and, and then, and then uh, I got, I was very fortunate. Uh, I, I won't get into names, but I, I got, uh, I, I reached out to some people from the National Security Council, the one that was the, the pandemic, or they call it the pandemic response team, but the, the, um, uh, global health security and biodefense department that was created under Obama and then dismantled by Trump in uh, 2018. And I got some of those real people to play themselves in this fictional movie. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so I'm I, now granted, I was doing the bulk of this before the shutdown. It's been made a little bit more. Not hmm? this is a fictional movie, not a documentary. So it's fiction based on fact heavily, heavily based on fact. I mean, using a lot of also newsreel footage to substantiate like kind of uh, what has happened uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and then I've actually, it's really fun as, it, as a filmmaker, as an artist, I've been able to engineer real world relationships that would not have existed where I not have made the film. So for instance, I have a character from the National Security Council who didn't know another character I have who plays a doctor, but who's also really a doctor in real life. But then I, in, then I create a fake relationship. I, well, I, I write a relationship between these two characters that never existed. And it doesn't just exist in the movie. It actually then does manifest into reality. So it's funny because if you were a documentary filmmaker and you were starting to massage and engineer these things, it would be unethical. Mm. Um, but when you start off making a fictional piece and then, and then you just, uh, you know, you, you, you take real elements. It's not neorealism. It's something else, but it, I just know that I just know intuitively that it fits very well with the post-truth uh, theme. Mm. It's like, yeah, that's kind of amazing. It's, it's like you have more liberty calling it a fictional film or a fictional plot line, but then yeah. you're kind of like altering the reality. Yeah, and, and the same way that we're confused, or mo most people are confused these days about what's real and what's not. I think to some extent we'll have that in this film too. And yet, I mean, look, we live in, a, we live in an era now that uh, you know, we're confronted with deep fake technology. And you know, how do I even know that I'm talking to you and you, you, know, you haven't been uh, kidnapped somewhere and this is one of your friends you know, just spoofing your face? Speaking as me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but I, I kind of see the connection between the way that you're making this film with um, sort of how you use these analog tools or like lo-fi, high tech, like whatever it is. It's just like a media, you're kind of figuring it out as you develop these tools, sharpen your, your toolkit. You're pretty, you're pretty astute uh, or, or, or perceptive. Astute has a little negative connotation. No, no, you're perceptive because, you know, you, I, I mean, I think I'm. A, I think of myself as, in that sense, as an opportunist, but in a positive sense of the word, mm -hmm. right? I, I, you know, a location becomes available. I, you see how I can use it. You know, uh, I meet somebody. I'm like, hmm, how can I put that in there? Yeah. So I, in that sense, I'm an opportunist. But I think most artists are opportunists. Right. And I'm an activist, and so you come kind of this. You, the, it, it, those things work very, very well together. Yeah. I think um, you know something presents itself. You see how it can advance the plot. And uh, sometimes it does. So how are you, um, are you taking any opportunities in this time of self-isolation? 
I mean, I have this idea that it's not about getting ahead, uh, but you know that, that that corny saying like, if life deals you a lemon, make lemonade. <laughs> I think my father must have said that to me as a kid. Um, so I think about that a lot. I'm like, okay, so we know the downside and the potential really downside, but how can, you know, how can we, uh, what can we do, not just for myself and my family, but, you know, for others as well. Um, you know, as an artist, uh, I, I mean, I think I could be wrong, but, and, and, and as a, you know, as an artist and gallerist yourself, um, I mean, it seems like to some extent the art market has slowed down, <laughs> I would say. Um, I mean, just when I thought that I wouldn't, that nobody would, uh, you know, want to buy a piece of art, you know, for the next year, which is fine. I mean, I'm in a position where that, that's not, that wouldn't be a problem, but suddenly some things popped up and I was like, Hmm, cause I have a lot of artists reaching out to me saying like, do you have any advice about what, you know, we might be able to do and during this time, which is a, which is a tough one. I mean, it's sort of as tough as, you know, if we didn't have a good, being an artist is tough at any time of the year, let alone in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm creating a lot. I'm doing a lot of, I, I mean, it, it's weird, but I'm doing, a, I'm doing like a lot of highly politicized and coronavirus slash political work. And it's for me, it's, it's, it's really, it's, I guess it really is a release. I don't think of when I do, when I work as, release but this is a really it's a way to vent in a way in a positive way i don't usually when i work it's not venting it's um it's trying to it's trying to uh, move closer to some sort of sense of truth and this, i find myself the work i'm doing right now it's i'm i'm trying to distill i'm it, well a lot, my work is a lot about distillation so i think i'm trying to take a lot of the confusion and the chaos and trying to just distill it mm -hmm. to a handful of words, um, you know, like there's been a lot of talk in the news about hydroxychloroquine um, and, you know, the president's shoving it down our throats, like in a re like really bizarre way. Like, you know, he, I, I have a clip where he's like, you know, come on, just try it. Just try Like, wow, just try it. Like, and, you know, yes, there's, there's, there, there's some, uh, there, there, well, that, it's, a, it's a highly charged controversial uh, subject. But already you know, a little over a month ago, I did a piece, uh, I have this series of yellow and black graphics that I do with uh, commented out code. And I, 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 it says hydroxychloroquine, and then the next line, follow the money. That's it. Um, and, you know, it took about, it didn't take that long, two, three weeks. And then suddenly it's like everybody's talking about, yeah, follow the money. It's like, there's a reason why, you know, tens of millions of doses of a drug that uh, has no proven track record with this virus. It has a proven track record with malaria. Why suddenly it's so, so popular. Um, well, there, there's something I won't say, I won't say from my wife, but from other doctors I know in the field, uh, I have heard numerous stories about that drug. You have to watch what I say, but that, that drug, uh, uh, putting people in a, in a really dire situation very quickly. Mm. It, causes, it causes cardiac arrhythmia, mm. you know. Um, yeah, it's great if you have malaria. It's great if you have lupus. It's, it's great in measured doses for those, for those things. But, uh, but when suddenly a, 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 an unproven pharmaceutic starts getting hype from every which angle and from the president yeah. with, such, with such force, you got to follow the money. And yeah, and so now there are all these stories about he's got, you know, he and some other people in, in, the, in the White House administration have investments in the companies who make these drugs. Yeah. And then you can argue, well, yeah, everybody has investments in pharmaceutical companies. Okay, I guess so. I'm just saying follow the money. And, and that has proven itself out over in the last couple of weeks. And so how do you feel like um, has been therapeutic for you or do you feel is this so like mindset I don't know you know what I don't know I I think this and a number of other pieces I I think I'm spending a lot of time uh trying to di distill the chaos into simple thoughts um I'm not sure if everybody has the time to do this or the interest in doing this uh and I know that 
as I, as I present these to people around me, um, they're like, that's it. That's exactly what I was thinking, you know? Um, so, I mean, I, I, don't, I didn't really put, I have a couple on Twitter and a couple on Instagram. I haven't, I haven't like put them all out there. Like it's not like, but, but uh, I don't want to be too preachy either. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause some of it, some of it's kind of obvious, but it's obvious once you see it in front of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you know, like, like a lot, like, what did I say about the liar? I said, uh, I don't know what did I say about the liar. When you hear a lie, call it out straight away. Uh, because if you don't, um, the, uh, the liar will be able to revise history. And we're seeing this play out all the time with relentless lies coming. And then there's this revisionist history taking place. And this, the only way to mitigate against this from happening is to call out the lie straight away. And we saw it yesterday. I don't know if anybody is watching the press conference, the, other, the briefing yesterday, but Paula Reed from CBS, she, you know, she's the first journalist I've seen at one of these uh, uh, press briefings in the last month, stand up to the president, call him out. No, no, she just boom, 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 one after another. No, no, you didn't answer my question. That's not it. And with, with the same force that he... Uh, uh, uses when he speaks. And then another journalist, she, you know, said, no, that's not, that's not true. She called out the lies straight away. You have to. We live in a, we live in a, in, in a, in a time now where, oh, don't get me started about the word deplorable. I did a piece today about the word deplorable, a highly politically charged word. Remember Hillary Clinton and the use of the word deplorable? She lost a lot of, she lost a lot of followers when she, when she, she referred to, she said, half the people uh, that uh, support Trump uh, are deplorables. They're a basket of def- de- deplorables. But then if you look up the definition of deplorable, um, somebody who uh, you know, is worthy of uh, co- uh, contempt and condemnation, it's like, okay. And you just logically go through it. And you know, so somebody who exhibits you know, flagrant dishonesty and uh, is somebody who is deplorable. So it just it got me thinking again about that word. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's so much power in words. I love words. I love, I love, I love word-based art. You, you work a lot with words. And, um, and also, I also noticed that you, worked, you had your recent piece in Russia. What was, like, I remember seeing some posts on... Um, oh, in Russia. Um, about uh, with blood. <clears throat> oh yeah, in oh in Fran- in Paris maybe, at at jeu de, at jeu de Pomme in Paris I did I showed the blood print. Uh, I am a coin. That's an alphanumeric. Yeah, again the alphanumeric. So you have this it's ser- ser- uh, uh, whether well in that case it was my blood that was printed, but um, you know alphanumerics that serve as proxies to distill emotional value. Um, and yeah, there's a power in that too. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's connected also to potential uh, ways that we, we communicate, com- machines could communicate in the future, or we could communicate in the future with augmented intelligence. But um, yeah, the power in those letters and numbers, I'm attracted to it visually. I'm also, uh, uh, I, I, I'm interested in how we, you know, how we uh, interpret you know, language when we see it in written form. Um, you know, I, I, if I show you 911, right away, you know what that means. You don't have to go 911. I actually, I think about this a lot with, with Chinese pictograms. You know, it's the same thing. It's like you just, this thing, you are imprinted with it. It's not like you're, I don't think you're, you're, you're looking around like, you know, okay, this is that. Nah, 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 nah. It's just bam, right? It just hits you. And, and I think that's an interesting thing about language is, that even a polysyllabic, uh, you know, English word, you look at it and you don't, you know, you, you kind of just, it just, it just impacts you instantaneously. Maybe as a kid, you have to, or, or, or if it's not your native language, you have to kind of look, look at it out. But otherwise, it just imprints on you. So I like the idea that perhaps if you had a, you know, 42 uh, digit alphanumeric, which is not 911, only three, that's 42 digits. But I like the idea that we could evolve somehow to a place where you could see that too and just right away you understand everything that that embodies in just an instant and if we can't do it naturally maybe we could do that with some sort of augmentation yeah and it's it kind of goes back to what you're saying of like now is a defining time 
calling it out. It's like very direct language. I mean, where are we now? We're, we're, this is, I believe that we are, this is the result of perhaps decades of anti-intellectualism, right? And we now have the poster child for anti-intellectualism as our leader. Um, and if some, you know, somebody reached out to me earlier and said, yeah, well, I'm an anti-intellectual. I'm like, okay, I mean, I don't think that's something to be proud of. Um, that could be your state, <laughs> but that, I don't think, I don't boast about that. Um, but, you know, it has been, I'm sorry, sorry to have to bring it back to China, but it's like, you know, China has a history too of like uh, what they did to the intellectuals. Uh, and then not just China, Russia did too. Uh, we're doing it now. We're, we are doing now what some other nations have done, you know, many decades ago, is we're trying to, we're actively marginalizing uh, the intelligentsia and the cult, uh, you know, I don't want to call them the cultural elite, because as soon as you use the word the elite, well, yeah, there should be no elite. But those who hold culture and intellect as dear are threatened. They're publicly humiliated. They're insulted. They're looked down upon. You know, don't talk to me with your fancy words. You know, I like straight talk. You know, um, yeah. So, so I mean, I, I, and, and those problems almost seem insurmountable to me. And as an artist, I am fascinated by this. I mean, it's really consuming me right now, you know, um, because I don't think this is as simple as, you know, uh, xenophobia or misogyny or Im immigration issues. Or I think it, it comes down to those who value truth and logic and those who don't. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what do you, I mean, I don't know, how do you turn somebody who doesn't value those things? We feel like it affects, because you have a lot of examples in many different places, in China and in Russia, yeah. Europe, and, and like, do you feel like it affects your, like, what you want to say in these different, <laughs> you kind of have to censor yourself sometimes, depending on who the audience is. So, Look, for sure, for for sure, there is a level of censorship, and 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 uh, I, I I'm I'm happy to say that in recent years, like in the last couple of years, um, I don't censor myself as much as I used to. Um, there were practical considerations before that I that I that caused me to self censor, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I mean, I have, I have, I have clients of mine, you know, patrons, um, some of which are uh, people who support oppressive regimes. Um, I mean, I know, I know that. Uh, I mean, in that sense, maybe I feel like Robin Hood, but um, I, I don't. I, I, I never sort of bite my tongue when I speak with them in, in private. They know how I feel about it. Look, like I, 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 I'm very uh, open about supporting the ethnic Uyghurs, uh, you know, which is a very, very sensitive issue in China. Um, and and I'm, I sit and dine with, uh, you know, big party people there and they know how I feel. And I mean, we don't, it's, not, it's not the topic, the main topic, of it's not the topic of conversation, but I mean, they know how I, they know how I feel. They know that uh, uh, they know that I I hang out with people they they, they don't like, uh, you know, uh, Chinese dissidents and stuff. But but then they, they haven't taken my visa away. Um, I get invited. I get invited to show at the National Museum of China. Yeah, that's really impressive. Well, I, I so I don't know. I mean, maybe I just haven't. Re maybe I'm just not. I haven't reached that critical mass where it's like, okay, let's turn this guy off, you know, but, and I don't want to, I don't want to like, you know, tempt fate, but uh, I also wouldn't want to end the channel of communication either. And my art is sort of my channel, mm -hmm. but I mean, I did a piece, I did a piece and I, I really haven't discussed it in public much yet and I but I and I, I will at some point but I did a piece that was up in up in the museum there in China I was invited and, um, and it's you know by all accounts it would definitely be a highly 
charged uh, political uh, kind of fiasco if they were to fully understand what was hanging in that museum for, uh, you know, 30 some days. I mean, it was all there in the description of the work in, I thought it was, but nobody kind of picked up on it. And the, it, actually it's sitting behind me, that yellow and black thing back there, there are three big panels. Mm. And so those were, I just got those back. They were, they were, uh, they were there and I don't know, a couple of million people, it was right on Tiananmen Square. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm always prepared to, well, you know, I, I, I think, look, I'm not, I'm not a threat to the, I'm not, I'm not a major threat to the, to the state. Uh, and I love, I love, I love China. I love the culture. I have lots of Chinese friends. It's just, I'm not thrilled about, you know, how they roll politically. Yeah. I'm not thrilled about how we roll politically here. Right. In fact, I can't think of any country where I'm particularly thrilled about, <laughs> about. <laughs> an interesting time to live it's like a very defining moment right now for for to like consider where we stand and like our personal beliefs as opposed to the environment because it really does the pandemic really does affect us directly in a way that many issues don't always affect everything. but there's the other the other pandemic the other deadly pandemic is anti-intellectualism and played out logically you and i are enemies of the state and enemies of the state must be dealt with, you know, in the name of keeping the state uh, healthy. I mean, I, that's where I see this going. I, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I'm not like, you know, doomsday kind of guy, but, but you see, it, they are calling out some of our, our best journalists as frauds and fake news purveyors, and, you know, um, and then the, they come the artists and the academics and the scientists. And we have an administration who doesn't actually listen to the scientists. So, I mean, what's next? I mean, why, you know, logical conclusion when, when the shit really hits the fan, then it's like, round us up, put us in camps. So the work that you're doing right now, like is productive in a way that is a direct reflection of, well, the work you're doing direct in your studio, like these days in self-isolation is as a direct uh, result of what's going on of like- Totally. And that's- Yeah. That's good use of time and like really, really opportunistic in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like to think so. It's terrible though, because I start off, I wake up and, and I'm doing the homeschooling with the, with the kids and, 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 I'm, and, I, and I have uh, every intention to, to, to work on, you know, I, I kind of make a, not a, I don't a list, a mental list. I'm gonna do this, 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 and this, and this. And then something happens in the news or Trump says something or somebody else says something. And it just throws me off. And the next thing I know, I'm making another one of my little yellow and black graphics. <laughs> to, you know, <laughs> How do you pick days to make sure, like, so between um, making your work and like homeschooling? Well, here's the funny thing about homeschooling is that, so I've met, I, and, and within the concept of homeschooling, you have unschooling and all these, there are different kind of, gradations of homeschooling. Uh, it's not about creating uh, the school in the home. Um, it's about educating children. Um, and, and another thing is that we, you really start to realize, and there's been talk, Cuomo was talking about this the other day, is that the school is not just about educating kids, it's daycare. Essentially, it's daycare for working people. So, uh, you know, and, and, and again, so I'm fortunate enough that I don't really, especially at this point, need to rely on it for daycare. Um, so, so anyway, so uh, I, I, I know a, a few people who, who have been doing homeschooling for years, both of their kids and kids are now off in college. And I've learned a lot from, you know, their, their experience, uh, experiences. And uh, what, so the idea usually is like you take their interests and everything gets pushed through those interests, kind of project-based learning. Um, but uh, what was I gonna say? Um, Yes, so I remember a couple of people have told me that you could compress an entire academic school year into two weeks. I've heard one month, but I've heard two weeks a few times too. And I'm like, really, two weeks? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, really? Like that's how inefficient the, the, the teaching mechanism is in school? Yes, I'm like, really? And when you look at it and you spend time looking, you, you realize it's damn true, you know? And the intensity that we work within two hours in a day 
you know, I'll say, uh, okay, I'm going to play you uh, this, uh, you know, National Geographic, BBC, or whatever, you know, a documentary. Uh, it's 10, 15 minutes on earthworms or, you know, uh, dissecting a squirrel. Watch this. Okay, they watch it. Okay, now I want you, and I, and I also have two different age groups, 10 and 7. I'm like, now I want you to uh, write uh, a full page. Don't do big letters, you know, fill out the whole page. I want you to describe to me, like, I have not seen this thing, and I know nothing about it. Uh, all about it. And so they do. And of course, there are spelling errors in there. Those become the spelling words. Then we have discussions around structure and who, what, why, where, when, how, all that. Uh, then we move on. You know, that, that whole thing takes uh, half an hour or so. Then on the apps, we do their French lessons. There are different levels. The two of them have their French lessons. Then we uh, do our math. Uh, and then depending on the day, they do a little piano or this, you know. And so, but within let's call it three hours in a day of, you know, it's, it's amazing what they learn. I think they learn in three hours. It's true. Like what they would learn in like three weeks in school. <laughs> so do you feel like your kids have have gone like leveled up in many ways? In some ways. I mean, I think they're, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like to think my kids are pretty bright and their like vocabularies are super advanced and all that, but uh, sure. I think with the, with the things like writing um, and, I mean, the vocabulary is just, uh, what did Nathan say yesterday? I don't know. He's only 10. I don't know. Oh, penultimate. <laughs> he was talking about, well, I, don't, I don't know where they get these words, but <laughs> he was telling me about the penultimate uh, event and, uh, and uh, characteristically, I'm like, characteristically, that's a big word. <laughs> I don't know. Like a little old man. I love it. I love it. <laughs> that's so cute. And what happens after the three hours for them? Like, do they? You just broke up. What what happens? What? What happens after the three hours of schooling with the kids? Well, what do you think they want to do? <laughs> they want to play on their <laughs> devices. <laughs> so it becomes this balance of uh, playing or activities that are not on devices, time to play on devices, which is usually playing like Roblox or Minecraft, um, and then uh, taking them to the park. Uh, Julia insisted on getting a trampoline, which I think is insane, but we have a trampoline now in the playroom, a small one. But I'm like, is that a good idea? They're like gonna shoot through the ceiling or something. Like, but they're high, high ceilings, so I guess that's not a problem. But the, uh, yeah, you know, we're adapting. Uh, what time is it? Oh, it's seven o'clock. They'll probably do their screaming outside soon. Okay. Yeah, it seems like we have a time limit. Um, oh, is it like I didn't one realize. minute? Oh, there's like a time limit. We have an hour, a minute and a half left for Instagram. Oh, live. oh, okay, yeah. good. But I'm seeing a ticking countdown. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, so we'll just wrap up, I guess. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you on live, and it was a really fun conversation, and, and I really wish you and your family well in this time. Thank you. You too, you too. Yeah. Also, is there a mask shortage at the hospital? Um, no. Mount Sinai? No. Okay. Gotcha. I mean, there are some shortages, I get, but no, th th that's a good thing. Is that It doesn't look like there's, I didn't see a shortage. She said in her department, there's no shortage. That's great. That's that good. is great. Yeah. Okay. Well, so thank you so much. And great. Enjoy. it seems like you're having a very productive time. Yeah. It's been very inspiring. China, you know, life deals you a lemon, you make lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good note to end on. Hope great. Let's talk again soon. Exactly. Take care. Bye. Have a good evening.